The issue of labor disputes and impasses with the government in Nigeria is not a new occurrence. As far back as the mid-1945, Nigeria witnessed its first general strike involving around 200 workers and 17 labor unions. Strikes and industrial actions have become a familiar sight in the country, occurring quite frequently. These actions serve as a means for the workers to take a stand when other avenues for addressing grievances have been exhausted. They are often viewed as the last resort to attain their needs and demands. It's worth noting that strikes in Nigeria have a historical context and are not solely a modern phenomenon. In addressing this ongoing issue, my guest believes that the government can employ various methods to establish a working relationship with organized labor. Newsnight sits down with Dr. Emeka Wogu, a lawyer and former Minister of Labor and Productivity from 2010 to 2014 to discuss possible solutions and insights into the matter. Mr. Wogu, thank you for speaking with us on Newsnight. Yeah, thank you. Um, industrial unrest has been a major challenge in Nigeria. I mean, it's, it's not something that started in the 80s or the 90s. It looks like it's something that started pre-independence. Um, but what would you say is the cause of the unrest and the strikes that we seem to be having in Nigeria? Well, um, let me begin by saying that the uh, Nigerian labor movement has been an integral part of um, struggle. Post-independence, they were part of the independence struggle. You recall that the first recorded and most violent workers' uh, strike or protest was in 1949. That led to the killing of uh, coal miners mm -hmm. and led to the jailing of prominent uh, labor uh, yes. you know, unionists. Pa Michael Imodu, Bobo Bwago, and many others. And what were they doing? They were comrades in arms with the Azikiwes, Awolowos, Habat Macaulay's mm. of this country. And they were fighting imperialism, colonialism, and unfair treatment of Nigerian workers and how workers at the coal mines in Enugu were being treated. Being treated. You know, inconducive or, you know, work environment, which Nigerian workers were made to work, was unbearable, undesirable, and not good for any worker to operate in. And coal at that time was a major export material, the best any, you know, mineral resource the country had because Nigerian coal was the best all over the world. And you know our colonial masters were British. Mm. And this coal was taken here to UK to power their trains, power their new industrial revolution with peanuts being paid. In fact, that was what led to the proper labor movement and the agitation in this country. You know, I mentioned one name, yeah. late by wow. Michael Imodu. So the struggle continued until, you know, the military interregnums. You know, from the 1966 coup, you know, going forward, mm -hmm. there was no tolerance of labor movement because those governments were governments that were undemocratic. They were military in nature and they abhor such dissent and discussions. So between 66 and um, 79, there were a lot of um, you know, violent clashes with labor. And at one point, I've forgotten the military administration that proscribed labor. So it took the democratic election of President Shagari, when Shagari came in 1979, for him, you know, to, for labor to, you know, find their voice again. And that was when people like Hassan Sumonu was in charge. And that led to the first wage, um, articulated wage act 
for Nigerian uh, Labour Congress under Pa Hassan Sumono, but very brilliant, uh, agile, active in his younger days. So, but he's highly respected, and he has continued to play various roles in government. Mm. Even in my during when I was a Labour Minister, I invited him to head the protracted uh, Labour issues in the power sector. But the struggle then was to have a minimum wage for the Nigerian worker, and he succeeded. It was 1,500, and Naira had value, okay? Mm. And then if we recall, the Udochi Commission yes. was not as a result of labor agitation. It was a result of the oil boom. And they found out that Nigerian workers need to be Taken care of part of this thing. And you know, it came with its own attendant uh, issues. But from Hassan Sumonu's uh, uh, presidency of the Nigerian Labor Congress, it continued in you know, various other presidents of um, the Labor Congress. Labor movement did their best, but again, there was a military interregnum. 88, there was a coup that brought in the former president of the country, Buhari, you know, and then labor was stifled again. Not even only labor, media was stifled with decree four, yeah. if you recall, and Nigerian Labor Congress was proscribed. You know, mark my word, I keep saying Nigerian Labour Congress because there was no TUC. Even TUC, under President Obasanjo, he abhorred, no, General Obasanjo, head of state, he abhorred Labour. But Buhari's uh, administration as head of state at Lord uh, NLC. Then subsequently, President and um, head of state, General Ibrahim Babangida, too didn't like the labor movement. He had problems with them. At the time, he brought an administrat administrator, led Pascal Bafia. And from there, the second time Obasanjo came, I think that one, if, if I don't mix everything, in between um, IBB, Abacha, and Obasanjo, civilian president, mm. TUC came up. TUC actually came into place because um, the administration, then I think it was President uh, Lucia Gunnar Bassan, wanted to weaken the NLC. NLC and break them. You know, they had one united resolve fight, agitate for the workers who are the vulnerable members of the society. So at the end of the day, TUC came up. So the, there came into place two labor centers the Nigerian Labour Congress and the Trade Union Congress. Congress. And that is the historical trajectory of Nigerian Labour. Mm. And mainly, they're always out to protect the workers, the workers. and their welfare. And, and their welfare. <laughs> but That's what, what has led to various agitations. Yes. And uh, we have statistics in the Ministry of Labour. I asked them to do comparative analysis and the number of strikes that you know have ha uh, that have taken place since 1952 when that ministry came into place and particularly asu because asu has been a recurring decimal in terms of uh, <laughs> industrial, <laughs> industrial, actions. industrial action so we have that statistics up to date and that will help policymakers in this new administration of President Bola Ahmed Tinibu to have a fair idea of how this trend has taken place. Now that he has shown a good interest, you know, to tackle labor issues in the country and for the welfare of the Nigerian worker, I mean the current administration of uh, President Tinibu, and even appreciating that the problem of removal of subsidy does not only affect the workers, it affects the other people, some okay. uh, entrepreneurs. Mm. So let's not jump the gun here. You, we've gone okay. from the historical to the present. <laughs> okay. uh, but know, let's, I let's, speak with passion when it comes to them. I know, I know which is why it's good that we're having this conversation. Mm. You've outla outlined all that have led to where we are now. 
more or less, how it started and at what point they were proscribed, at what point the TUC came in more or less to weaken the NLC. But now they both all come together to say, mm. we're fighting for the same cause. So let's focus yeah, together. Because, uh, because you know, remember the clincher? Mm. Injury for one is injury, injury for, for all. So that is the uniting uh, factor yeah. for NLC and TUC, despite their own differences. Okay. But in the build-up, in all of this, one thing has remained a, um, how do you say now, a recurring decimal, so to speak, government. Being the reason why the labor unions are striking and taking up arms and all of that. Following through on agreement. Has that always been the situation? I mean, from the 50s, when from 1949, when this whole thing started, has it been about following through on agreements made? No, I think uh, the proper thing is uh, even the government, you know, government, labor, and employers and uh, consultative association oh. form what we call tripartite, you know, arrangement in labor administration. What it means is that both, you know, are partners. Mm -hmm. And most times when there are crises, agitation, and government is participating, labor is participating and NECA is participating. There are gaps hmm, that I notice because some of the people who go for these uh, uh, discussions mm -hmm. are either not properly trained in labor administration or they have an approximate knowledge of both the labor acts and the labor laws or the Principles of um, principles of negotiation is a skill. So once you put people, I will give you one example. When I became Minister of Labor and Productivity, there was this particular agreement done in 2009 between the Nigerian government and ASU. That agreement has been the problem in between government, society, government, and ASU. Till now. No, but I did a renegotiation with us in 2013, and we agreed on terms. And we, be, uh, we started by paying. So I think subsequent government that came, I don't know what they did with that agreement, because there was a provision for renegotiation, mm. which we did. But the principal memorandum of, as, um, as a memorandum of understanding in 2009 is the, uh, is the problem poorly couched and poorly negotiated. And that's why we fell into that problem. And there are numerous forms of it. When I was Minister of Labor, I improved on, uh, you know, instead of uh, asking uh, Labor, civil servants in Minister of Labor to embark on jamborees, I made sure that they, they attended uh, our labor, uh, labor summits in Turin. Turin is in Italy. And then I now took it upon myself to improve on the condition of Michael Limodu Institute of uh, Labor Studies so, so that people will take advantage, I mean uh, officers of Minister of Labor, in training and retraining. And uh, you equally got people from NECA, the employers, this thing, and labor people. So the problem that has always led to these incessant problems you alluded to is improperly couched uh, collective bargained agreement. We call it CBA, CBS. So when they are po poorly uh, couched, implementation becomes a problem. And once it is not implemented, then there is loss, uh, loss of confidence you know, on both sides. And mainly, the loss of confidence you know, weighs more on the government because implementation of the CBS are not carried as it is agreed. And that is what has led to many incessant uh, strikes in uh, health, in education, mm. in uh, oil and gas, and several other sectors. Because there are, you know, even... There was a time that even the Nigerian poli uh, police officers wanted to go to, uh, on strike. And these are essential services, and by law, they are prohibited from going on strike, even medical doctors. And then, um, you know, there's an NMA, 
my dear medical association, there is National Association of Resident Doctors. And when we were having crisis, I took, I made a suggestion, and my principal, then President uh, Gujoke Bele Jonathan GCFR, bought the idea. And the idea was to go to other climes and look at how the health sector op uh, operates. Because growing up, I told him that growing up, um, when my father had a relapse in his bone marrow transplant, you know, as a result of having a, a cancer, leukemia, mm. you know, so he was taken to UNTH. He had this bone marrow graft. Then we went to UNTH. You can see a whole lot of the medical team, including dietitians, physiotherapists, working under a harmonious uh, condition. But what we met here after Professor Lambo left, and then Professor Chuku was up to the tax, including the Minister of State Party, who has been renominated as minister. So what we met was disunity in that sector. Nurses want to be consultants, pharmacists would want to be consultants and everything. So what we needed to do was to harmonize, you know that kind of uh, disharmony in the sector. So President Jonathan impaneled, um, how will I address him, Dr. Uh, Alaji Ahmed Yayale, and he came up with beautiful report. I don't know where that report is, so implementation is another problem. So that's one example, you know. So if we can go back to historical or institutional memory, we we'll find the uh, we'll find the solution to most of these problems. There no. are many more of the reports mm. that have gathered. I was going to, to to take you back to that to the reports. Many reports are having um, that have come out of different panels, different committees. Um, let's case in point. Uh, Cutting down cost of governance. There are also a report, for instance. I'm not saying we should dwell on that. No, no, for no, no, no. It's an area that I have a, a grasp of. Okay. And I played a, 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 a major role, role in it. So that also a report looked at how to cut down cost of government. Talks about merging some ministries and redeploying some people to mm. different aspects. The other part is, again, the, the report you talked about, the medical sector. How do we harmonize the medical sector? Because Nigerians are concerned about the multiplicity of unions. Everywhere you turn, everybody has a union and they are unionizing for a purpose. Yes, the Labour Act says no employee should be stopped from unionizing. And a lot of Nigerians don't even know that, but yet they are concerned about everybody has an association. For instance, you might get to one industry and find out that White Wearing Workers Association of Nigeria. Everybody there wear white, wears white. Mm. You know. So how do we get to that point where we successive governments can go back and look at some of these reports and bring them forward for implementation. Maybe that will solve these issues of strikes and okay, protests. Let me give you a typical example. No government will want to run a huge bureaucracy that you spend money where there is no need to spend money. So there are agencies of government. I won't say ministry, departments and agencies. Ministries, okay, there were no problems. He never recommended measures of ministries, but there were departments and agencies that were unnecessary. He came with a report. Then President uh, Jonathan, as at that time, headed the, we looked at the report, and because of the legal implications, there was um, a committee, white paper committee, you know, these things have to be reduced to a white paper and to be accepted by government. So beautiful report. So we, Mohamed Adoke, SAN, CFR, was the head, uh, chairman of that committee. I was a member. Prominent uh, civil servants who were part of, uh, part of the cabinet, then like uh, Ms. Ama Pepper mm -hmm. and some other people, were part of it. Looked at it, came up with um, a white paper, I think because of the evolution of time, I resigned earlier, 2014, from cabinet. But I know that report was not, you know, the white paper has not been de uh, debated upon, you know, before the federal executive then. But when President Buhari came, 
he he made an attempt to to review the Orasanian's um, report, which is rationalization of uh, MDS. And at that time, there were more commissions and agencies that had been created by act acts of National Assembly. So it was even a huge problem. But my private company, you know, and I very, you know, I appreciate their reaching out to me. I was involved because they saw the reports and saw my name. Mm. I knew that this particular person would have a knowledge of what should be done. I was engaged. And my own report, the aspect of the assignment they gave to me, we submitted. And that particular, that particular time, November last year, our recommendation would have said the federal government more than 260 billion. Hmm? And we, you know, and we looked at some aspects of the Russian and this thing and uh, validated it. Because I was a player and I knew, you know, from benefit of hindsight and institutional memory. And again, coming from a background where I was chairman of remuneration and monetization committee of the Revenue Mobilization and Location and Physical Commission, I came with the knowledge that huge expenditure by government was unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Before official cars we are bought for everybody, we monetized it. <laughs> Tires we are bought centrally. So after three months or two weeks, the transport officer at all levels of government will come, okay, your tires are bad, this, this, that. My report as chairman then, we said, no, monetize this thing. No um, official car for any official of government. During my tenure as minister, I never used any official car because I was being paid. I took a loan. Newspapers are supposed to be paid by the public officer, not bought for a big man, minister, bought for this, you know. So all those things we are cost cut, cutting. But again, implementation became a problem. Big, big problem. So in this country, we have, uh, okay, there was another committee I served in. I was vice chairman to Dr. N. Shoneko. There was a salary co uh, committee uh, uh, set up by former president of Basanjo. The idea was to have a harmonized salary mm -hmm. in the public sector and in the private sector so that people can migrate from Shell, Nigerian Limited, or Shell, um, you know, corporation, to civil service. And at the same time, a civil servant can migrate from civil service, which is public sector, to these um, international uh, organizations so that we have one stream salary, so that, uh, you know, harmonizing it. Who came with a report, submitted it. I was part of the sal uh, salary committee before I became minister that came with the 18,000 uh, recommendation and which we negotiated with them. You were talking about um, the Orosan report and the process behind the fact that the white paper was not debated at um, the federal ex executive class. At the time I As at the time we were there. I left. At the time you left, yes. So what's the status? Of? Well, what I, I would say is that that report was good report as at that time. You know, let us say after that time, several commissions and agencies have been put in place. Yeah. So which By an would have distorted that report. But we had a white paper. And uh, at the time we finished our work, I resigned to go and run for governorship election in my state, 2014 in November. Then even if it was not debated upon or on, and then it's still there, it's a necessary document that will guide this administration. Then the effort of uh, President Buhari's administration, where they came to look for me to offer a help, and which I did, is a document that is still as fresh as November 2022. Okay. I did it as a private consultant. So those things are the things this administration, because there is no way a government can go on with that kind of huge uh, recurrent expenditure, more of personnel. And uh, with, uh, my report, I advise the government on severance, kind of right sizing. So when you're merging, you don't merge with all the staff. There are some who are uh, what I will call them, 
you know, they can't fit in again. So you can't have a job that can be done by one person in this knowledge economy and is being done by 20 or 30 people. In this age, technological age, where a simple keyboard can do the job. So it will cost the government money, but it will be a one-off. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it will help the government. To save money. <laughs> but let's, let's come back again. Talking about agreements and... So I advise the administration to take the whole thing and implement it. Yeah. Okay. So talking about agreements and um, reports that have been, whether they are in use or not, these, the labor unions most times come back to the government for negotiation. I mean, since that 1949, you've had them come back at every point in time to negotiate, to put forth warn, warnings that, hey, if you don't look at this report or you don't look at this, we're going to go on strike and all of that. As a former labor minister, what would you say is the challenge with government negotiating with labor? Well, um, it depends on... Um First, let me begin by saying that uh, I came at a time that I had all the support I could get. Maximum support from the president then. I had access to him. He encouraged me. And then I was proactive about the whole thing. I didn't wait labor strikes to happen on me. That was why people thought I had the magic wand. Proactive in that I had people formally and informally to give me a seat rep. The State Department of Security, I worked with them, the office of the NSA from Azazi down to Sambo, Dasuki Sambo. They provided some intel. Mm. Then I had informal people among the workers who give me intel. So even when I, I flip through the newspapers, I know there's a threat I will invite for a meeting and to apprehend. That's what the law says. And then my colleagues, who were ministers in those uh, uh, areas that were hot, particularly Ministry of Health, Professor Nebuchi Chuku, and his colleague, Dr. Pate, um, Petroleum Minister then, Mrs. Alison Madweke, because of the Peng Pengasan, I had cooperation. I had cooperation from the Minister of Education then, Rukia, Rukia too. Mm -hmm. I had, you know, they used to come to my office, small office, but, you know, we were visited by big people. And my style was engage them and stop uh, strikes. Like the one that the National Grid was switched up when uh, Ajero Joe was the general secretary of the electricity workers, Nui, and then his president of NLC. You know, he had the, Long negotiation, some spanning into hours, 13 hours, 15 hours. Not only in that power sector, but I was able to resolve the issues. And those issues, you know, that were resolved, I mentioned Pasumon and the people. So I brought people. I used to advise the president to, uh, oh, please, can you engage Adam Social Money? We, we engaged him a couple of times. There was even a stage, the current president was part of us, where we were going to, you know, discuss oil subsidy removal. Mm. So, you know, he has an experience. Yes. He participated in our own, where something went wrong along the line. Well, you know, so now, he has a, so we were not shy of involving people who have deep knowledge of distance. So during my own time, there were times I would even engage traditional rulers to go after some of uh, the labor leaders, you know, who have run away to their <laughs> localities, you know. So there was, and I had a good relationship with them. I never missed the, uh, their bad days. Once this labor leader has a bad day, I'll send it. Once they are bereaved, once they have child distance, so it's either relationships. Go, yes, and I uh, made sure that they equally join me in this um, labor uh, ILO. So, some other things. so I, had a, I had a good relationship with them. And uh, mind you that uh, my time was difficult. And once there's any ac acrimonious election, there will be labor issues following either you know, I don't, I don't want to allege what, but the pattern of history, I'm being historical, 
I came as a minister 2010. I met a strike on the ground. I met the power, this, this, that, that. But I was able to, to do it. 13 months. And I thought I would not come back. But after the 2011 election, there were intel of disturbances, you know, to, you know, because there was that election, most people did not believe that, you know, we Most won, people. and we did. And eventually, you know, there was the op opposition of, uh, I think, I know, uh, that time, uh, uh, we, that election was between President Jonathan and uh, President Buhari, majorly. So I was called out of vacation. and asked to come eh, immediately to help in resolving those issues. So that was why, before the president could constitute his cabinet fully, he presented 12. So what is even happening now is historical. It has happened before. Ministers can come in batches. So we are 12 that the president, uh, Jonathan, believed that should come back. And I was one of them. Mm. And the day after swearing in, I swung into action. I visited in LLC to first of all thank them for the first tenor. And they said there's a strike on the ground. Oh, I said, won't you reciprocate my visit? They said they will come. So when they came, we started negotiating. And that strike was. So are you implying that negotiations can be done, mustn't be all formal? Is yes. You have to develop your skill. You know, you have to be rigid, you have to follow the Labor Act. Labor laws, Trade Dispute Act, you have to follow the law first. But you must develop a skillful manner of getting things done for you. It's not rocket science, it's not juju, it's not voodoo. It is God's mercy upon me that hurt me. Mm -hmm. And how did it help me? I have the skills of communicating. Relationship. And then that relationship remained. And I told them it's not adversarial, not you against government, not government. And the win-win, win-win attitude, it helped. Hmm? Mm -hmm. If there's a wedding fatia in Gombe and it involves a labor uh, leader's daughter, I will be there also. If there's salah, I used to break my salah with some of the labor leaders up, up north. I used to join some labor leaders in the South, Christmas Day, New Year. Attend weddings, attend ceremonies and all that. They value it. And again, I realized that most of these labor leaders are properly trained. They have knowledge. And some of them who we are training during the bipolar arrangement, who we are trained in the East, Russia, Europe, they can subvert a government and they can pull a government down. And 2011 was tending towards that. And you know, the labor leaders too have political affiliations. There was no labor party then for them. Labor party belongs to them. So, but it's either they were ANPP or PDP, they have sympathies. So I think at the end of the day, I succeeded by the grace of God. Most people will think the C.O.M. I have. It is merited. I did not lobby. I did not, you know, go to anybody that I want a national honor. Mm. Mr. President honored me with a C.O.M. Commander Order of Niger. And when I asked the reason, sir, I didn't lobby. I didn't do anything. He said, you have performed creditably. And we are very few, about five of us. Mm. And the letter of recommendation is here. You can see, you can see it <laughs> on the certificate. So I'm trying to tell you certain things. A country does not forget the efforts of people who have helped them in the past mm. or currently. Mm. The Cunions, in your time, you've talked about how you succeeded. You built relationships. You, you, you stretch your... You stretched out your hand across the divide. You had personal engagement with them. You went for their personal events. So that helped. But I'm sure there were times in those days when they accused you 
of failing to to honor certain agreements you had with them, maybe gentleman agreements. Were there moments like that? And how did you tend to handle those things? No, you see, um, that's why we always go for review. I was honest with Lebo. There are times I would say this agreement cannot be implemented. Not because it didn't emanate from our, my own administration. There are certain things you need to take into consideration, some certain parameters and indices like revenue profile, affordability and sustainability. So I cannot because we don't want a strike, you know, and then uh, get my government into agreements that are not implementable. So where where demand or uh, let me not say where because sometimes their demands they are still demanding some things. Do you think the demands of labor are beyond um, the government to handle? Well, I would say that their demands are legitimate first. Hmm? If they are asking for a salary increase, then there must be a need. Inflation must have taken place. There are certain things now that they are agitating. There must be a wage increase, even within the pendency of the current um, Minimum Wage Act, is because life has become difficult for the Nigerian workers. And I would say that the suffering which they have highlighted could only be overcome with proper management of the economy. Mm. Because uh, right now, President Tinibu, who has had the courage to remove the oil fuel subsidy, has told the nation that a lot of money has been has accrued uh, to the federation account because of this uh, particular removal. That shows us that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. So at the end of the day, the big question is how does it affect the common man on the street and the Nigerian worker? Is, is, you get what I mean? Yes. What it means is that there must be management of those things he reeled out. Those palliatives, the nano, you know, I'm so impressed with his uh, approach to nano businesses. You know, nano are lower, you know, they are part of a, a, a medium scale, uh, medium and small scale enterprises. Mm. Hmm? It, is, um, it is part of it. But at a level that one, two, three people can even operate at 50,000. So what it means is that he's not looking at only civil servants. He's looking, I mean, paid uh, servants. He's looking at other people down the line. Mm. So that is very encouraging. He mentioned purchase of buses that would be run on uh, CNGs. Those are palliatives that will uh, ameliorate the workers uh, this thing, you know, shock on the removal of subsidy. And with time, the fuel prices will adjust. And I think that is why President uh, Tinibu has agreed that some refineries will come into operation. But first, from what I read in the media, the one in Port Harcourt. So once we can refine our oil and then with the floating of Naira, and we have an influx of dollar. So everything is based on the economy, not really agitation for salary increase. Because once a salary is increased, there will be inflection. Yeah. So what is important is not the quantum of the Naira. It is the value of the Naira in terms of, you know, when they had one thousand, when workers had 1,500, it took time for another agitation to come because Naira had value. And what was the exchange rate between Naira and dollar? And the exchange rate between Naira and the dollar now. So everything boils down to a robust economy. And which the president has promised, President Tinibu, mm. that he's going to do. And uh, we all believe him. Mm. And we'll always wish him well. You know, pray that, for him. So the arguments that uh, many times what government does when labor comes up is throw money at them. You throw money at labor. And the president has promised to purchase of buses. Now, what if Nigeria had a structured transport system? Mm. Agitations like this will not be coming up again. 
Okay, you see what happened during the, our own first subsidy removal. There were suggestions, even uh, I remember um, somebody came with an idea of transport czar. We bought buses. Those buses have disappeared. If you, if you are passing through Abuja to Kubwa, mm. you see the Erufai buses during Obasanjo. Yes. So there is no maintenance culture. What this administration would have leveraged on is those past, you know, uh, transport uh, system. And it, you recall that in Lagos, transportation, intermodal transportation is not the problem again. It started with this President Tinibu when he was governor of uh, Lagos State. Mm. So through Fashola, Ambode, and now uh, Samuel, who is going, you know, who has uh, continued with the rail, uh, blue rail and the red rail, and they have intermodal system where you have the train operating at the same time with the buses and everything, and even the uh, marine transport, they have continued and they have even bought electric buses. So if President Tinubu will, you know, bring that into a bring, bigger scale. Bring what he did in Lagos in terms of this uh, transportation to the center here, it will help. Mm. But I want to remind him that there are buses that are still lying west. Mm. And we have local manufacturers like Enosin. So what we need to do in mass transportation is if we agree on CNG, we will get all these uh, companies that are involved in uh, uh, buses. And then, uh, act, you know, it will save us from, uh, you know, scarce dollars. Rather, we'll, you know, encourage them to do the buses here. We'll save money. And encourage them to uh, export to other countries. Mm. So I think that's the, the problem. Let's that's go back a little bit to when you were in government. You, you had a couple of strikes that you, you were able to um, mm. end. You had the maritime workers, health workers, Mm. Judicial workers, um, colleges of education, lecturers in colleges of education also had their own strike as well within the period you were in power. Now, yeah. all of these people here had certain negotiations they negotiated with government. And after your time, they've had strikes like that again in these different unions. Okay, you see what happened. Some of those uh, strikes were, uh, were either successfully apprehended, was nipped in the board. They never manifested, but the ones that came up were equally successfully managed. I'll give you an example. After our experience, after my experience with the power sector, I now say, Kai, it's expensive to restart those uh, turbines. I made sure that Nupeng and Pengasan never went on strike. You can imagine when they go on strike and all you was are shut down. It will be huge, it will cost the country a huge amount of money, you know, to bring back those. Um, in aviation, there was no strike. Mm. I made sure there was no strike in aviation. Judiciary, which is my own <laughs> constituency, I had a CJM, the first chief, uh, female chief judge of Nigeria who cooperated with me. That is why you did have uh, incidences of uh, strike there. The only time they gave a notice, they went off for one day and we resolved it with her support. So I think uh, which other one was equally challenging, but where we had difficulties still was us and health. But I've gone through the statistics. They are, they are valuable. At least um, <laughs> they didn't have as long, we didn't have as long number of weeks. Like they had either the uh, uh, previous administration before, or the preceding administration. Mm. So, but if you if you had a choice, if you had a chance, what would you do differently? What I would have done differently would uh, because I, immediately I came out of government, I brought a sheet of paper, my successes and my failures. I'm a human being. I'm not infallible, mm. but my successes far at where my shortcomings. So those shortcomings I know have over the years improved upon them. I'll give you an example. After the power sector strike, I looked 
at the Power Sector Reform Act, I saw violations on the side of government and violations on the side of labor. I said, ah, this is an interesting area. I need to go back to the classrooms. I went back to the University of Nigeria and Soka. I made a distinction in my PhD. And what was it? Power Sector Reform Act and management of labor issues between 2010 and 2014. That's my PhD dissertation. Mm. You can see the picture. So because I saw that <laughs> we didn't do well there, so I went back to school, did the research, and came up with the fact that we made some mistakes. And that is why the privatization did not work. Mm. One of the things that Nigerians are hoping that this administration will do is cut down the cost of government. Legal, labor is negotiating and asking for a, an increase in minimum wage to at least, I think, about 200,000 or thereabout. That will add to the wage burden of the nation. Um, so, what do you think can be done to cut down the cost of governance? You mentioned something earlier about using local manufacturers of vehicles, but let's look at generally as we wind down here. How can government pay all the wages that need to be paid to the labor unions, I mean to the workers, ensure their welfare is good, and yet still cut down the cost of government? Well, is um, you know the current minimum wage now, by law, is 30000 and uh, by next year, there will be a need to have a new minimum wage. So negotiation should have commenced by now by the labor unions and government so that we are not taken on our ways. So like I said, it's not the quantum of money. So right now, nobody can do that except an award. You know, an award does not touch the wage law. An award is uh, something that can come. Like an allowance? That can be negotiated, you know, to ameliorate the sufferings. Pending the evolution of time for the current law. And that is 2024. So being proactive, government and labor should start meeting now to discuss the parameters. But what could come is a semblance of a dodgy commission of 1974. You know, people kept saying Udoji Award. It was not just an award. It was a commission that came with re reformations, uh, came with reforms in, in the public service. And those re uh, reforms, you know, <laughs> cost a lot of inflation from a meager 5% uh, in 1973 to about 12 in 1974, and it continued. So what that Odoji Award, it took, uh, uh, Odoji Award was more of salary increase and some other re uh, reforms in the sector. But what can be done by government now is to begin the process of discussing uh, how to mitigate the sufferings. And it can come as an award that is not salary per se. Because if you want to increase the salary, it's either you amend that law now and um, uh, shorten the period of um, when it will lapse. So if National Assembly, within the one week, they say they've intervened, can actually say, OK, this is our law that is supposed to lapse by 2024, we will now amend it so that, uh, <laughs> you get what I mean, yeah. so that I shorten the period of uh, lapsing of government by way of negotiation discussions. Because you can't just do it uh, arbitrarily. You can come with a presidential um, order, executive order, uh, awarding money which will be more of compensatory for workers in addition to the palliatives. Uh, so <laughs> discussing wage increase now, the time has not come. But discussing a compensatory award can come in, in the interim. Okay. Okay. Before this time, this is what you will have hanging with it, hanging strongly, and we are giving you 
mass transportation, we are doing this, we are doing and that. would that. also be adding to the weight burden of the government, increasing cost of government. And, but, and that's what, um, now that uh, Mr. President has a team, he will set up the economic team, then and the parameters that will be used to discuss the award is a uh, revenue profile with the Nigerian workers, they call it no, is in the public domain. Affordability and sustainability, and more importantly, managing leakages. And I think this president is determined to do it. There are a lot of leakages, money that are supposed to come in and stuck in few hands, you know, because of corruption. And once President Tinibu will plug that in, and he needs people with back experience. And he has a commission, a revenue commission, that he can work with. When I worked there, I was very active. I was, um, <laughs> you know, in fact, I was quite young. I came there at 35, then became minister at 45. Mm -hmm. But Haman Tuku, late engineer Haman Tuku, you know, was the chairman. We are forthright telling the government this is the problem. This is the... There was even issues of domestic uh, crude mismanagement. So many issues. So he present uh, Tinibu can plug those things, and I know he can. You know, going by his pedigree. You know, like I mentioned, his uh, what he bequeathed to Lagos State Transportation and the model and revenue. You know, he jumped, jumped it. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on today's program. We value your opinions on the conversation. You can engage with us through our social media handles displayed on your screen. Additionally, you can listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast on our website, channelstv.com forward slash podcast. I'm Neota Igwe. Goodbye.